Welcome everyone to the Making Connections webinar series presented by Seniors Health Knowledge Network. My name is Lindsay Toth and I am the Technology and Admin Manager at SHKN and the facilitator for this webinar. Marguerite Thomas also joins us on the line today. She is the coordinator of the Ontario Falls Prevention Community of Practice and will be assisting with the webinar technology. Before we begin, I'm going to give you a quick rundown on the Level 3 web meeting system. This webinar technology consists of two parts. The audio is provided through a telephone conference line and the visuals are provided through a web platform. The number for the conference line and the link for the web platform were sent to you by email after you registered for the webinar with Level 3. If you have questions about the technology at any time during this presentation, please type them into the chat box located on the left-hand side of your screen. Alternatively, you can send me an email to ltoss at seniorshealthknowledgenetwork.com. I will work with you to resolve technical issues as soon as possible. This webinar will contain an opportunity for discussion during a question and answer period at the end. If you have topic-related questions during the presentation, please type them into the chat box. During the Q&A, I will read those questions aloud to the presenter. If you would prefer to ask a question over the phone, you may unmute your line by dialing star 7 when prompted. When you are finished, we ask that you please dial star 6 to re-mute your line. This webinar is being recorded. The recording and the slide deck will be circulated by email after the webinar. I would now like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Susan Leet. Dr. Leet is a professor at the University of Waterloo and a clinician in the Pediatric and Special Needs Clinic, as well as the Low Vision Clinic. Dr. Leet, I invite you to unmute your phone by dialing star 7 now. Hello. Hi. Take it away. Oh, okay. So, uh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to part 2 of the uh, presentation that I've put together. Uh, so, uh, as you remember, if you were here for the first part, we talked about some of the normal changes that happen in the eye and vision with age. And um, I mentioned also about uh, visual impairment and uh, some of the common eye diseases and also about low vision rehabilitation. So today we're talking about the relationship with vi between vision and falls. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about some of my research and then we'll talk about modifying visual risk factors and environmental modifications as far as vision is concerned. So I'm sure you're all aware that uh, the causes of falls is very multifactorial. And in here we have a list of them. They sort of tend to be divided into four categories. So this is the biological and medical risk factors. And as you can see, vision is listed as one of them. It consistently is found to be related. And then we have the behavioral uh, risk of uh, list of risk factors on the left here, and then environmental risk factors. And um, again, I've highlighted in red some of the ones that I'm going to be mentioning later on. And lastly, socioeconomic ones. And uh, the rate of falls increases uh, these with as these risk factors increase. So the risk factors seem to be additive, so that if you have um, four or more factors, then your risk increases to seven, by 78%. So let's talk about vision. So what particular aspects of vision are associated with falls? And when we look at this uh, literature, we find that um, often uh, measures of balance are looked at as well, or hip fractures, which of course are very related to falls. So the first factor is visual acuity. And so this is the eye's ability to see fine detail, which is of high contrast, usually measured with the visual acuity chart. And this has been measured in loads of studies. And it's consistently almost always comes up as a risk factor, increasing the risk of falls by about one and a half to two times. So that's your basic visual acuity, often measured with both eyes together. But in some studies, they've uh, looked at the visual acuity in each eye separately and look at whether there's a difference between the two eyes. And um, that has sometimes been found to be more related to the risk of a fall than just simply having uh, an overall loss uh, of visual acuity in both eyes at about the same amount. So visual acuity is sometimes also looked at in terms of visual impairment. So there have been a few studies that have looked at this. Uh, and when we define visual impairment, it's usually defined in terms of visual acuity. So these two are related, but just a different way of looking at it. 
And uh, what studies have found is that visual impairment is three times more common in fallers than the non-fallers. And then a very interesting study looked at the patients who admitted to an ER in a hospital for fall or hip fractures. And they found that between 46 and 76 percent of these patients had visual acuity of less than 20 over 60, which means they basically would be classified as being visually impaired. But another interesting point of these studies is that the majority uh, had vision loss that was correctable, either by cataract surgery, which is fairly straightforward surgery, or by just simply updating their spectacles. Contrast sensitivity, which we mentioned last time, is also uh, been shown fairly frequently to be related to falls. And uh, also stereopsis has um, been found to be related quite frequently. So stereopsis uh, is one way in which we judge depth or how far away things are from us. It's not the only way that we judge depth. There are several cues to depth perception. So if you look at this photograph here, you can tell that the person on the left is closer than the uh, person in yellow because uh, he's bigger. And so that's one uh, cue to depth or how far away things are, the size of objects. But also you can tell that he is closer because he's about to walk in front of the other person. So these are some of the cues. But when we talk about stereopsis, what we mean is that each eye, because they're laterally situa situated, has a very slightly different view on the world. And the brain can um, look at those differences um, or analyze those differences between the two eyes and, and use that to tell how far away we are from something. And so stereopsis uh, uh, has been shown to be linked. Both depth, per depth perception and stereopsis specifically have been shown to be linked um, to the risk of falls. And uh, they do, this does have implications because uh, in a study that I'm going to describe late, later, we did find that poor binocular vision is linked to poor balance. And uh, if you have poor binocular vision, you're almost certainly going to have poor stereopsis. So those two factors are related. It also has implications for some patients, for some people who have what we call monovision contact lenses. So this is where one eye is corrected for reading and the other eye is corrected for distance. So that's convenient. You don't have to wear bifocals. But uh, one effect of it is that it will decrease your level of stereopsis. Visual fields also have been shown to be related. So certainly binocular field loss is associated with increased sway. And that's been shown in a couple of different studies, whether it be central visual field loss or peripheral visual field loss. And specifically in glaucoma, it's been shown that lower visual field loss, which is the part of your visual field which is probably more important for walking about, is related to more falls and more injurious falls. And uh, more field loss has also been shown to be more related to fear of falling. So those are the basic clinical measures of um, vision that, uh, that are frequently measured. But there are other uh, ways that we can look at vision. We talked last time about visual attention. So this is where you have to do a task where you're doing two visual tasks at the same time, or where you are trying to search for a target which is amongst a um, bunch of distractors. So uh, again, I'm going to talk a little bit more about this later, but this has been shown to be related to mobility and balance and various tests of walking. Uh, other aspects that have been begun to look at is uh, visual spatial vision, eye movements, light and dark adaptation, and glare sensitivity. And some of these you may notice are the ones that we found we talked about last time as being more related to aging than changes in visual acuity itself. So uh, what about ocular disease? So some studies have looked at specific ocular diseases as risk factors. And those that looked at cataract have pretty much unanimously agreed that cataract, the presence of cataract, does increase the risk for falls. When it comes to other eye diseases, the picture is not quite so clear. So uh, some studies have looked at glaucoma or macular degeneration and diabetes. And the, study, the results of the studies are not unanimous. I think the reason for this is that some of these studies are re relying on self-report of uh, whether the person has an eye disease or not. But they also don't look at the, um, the how advanced the disease is. 
or the severity of the disease. So you've probably got a mixed bag of people, who some who have little effect on their vision due to the disease and some who have a very large loss of vision. So in fact, uh, what's probably turning out to be the case now is that uh, the risk is from the actual functional visual losses that the people have rather than the presence or absence of the disease itself. So, so those are the, uh, the main types of vision measures that have been looked at in terms of falls. So why does poor vision increase falls? So you might think this is an obvious question, but you know, just to analyze it a little bit. So we know that the bal our balance is maintained by input from three main systems, the proprioreceptor system, the vestibular system, and visual systems. Now, as we age, there's less input from all of these three systems. So there's less input from the vestibular and the proprioceptive system. So that what happens is older adults rely more on their vision. And uh, this happens earlier in women than in men, so as early as 50 years of age. So of course, then when vision also is disrupted, the person is likely to sway more and therefore be more prone to a fall. And so then when vision is reduced, as I said, and this could be due to aging itself or to presence of eye disease, or it could be due to a specific situation in the environment, there's going to be more, even more risk for falls. So an example in the environment might be uh, when the person gets up at night and doesn't turn the lights on, there's going to be less visual input, or in a dark stairway, stairway, or in situations where people don't wear their spectacles. So commonly, you know, people might not put their spectacles on at night to go to the bathroom or when they're showering, obviously. Uh, and often in hospital situations, people seem to lose or don't use their spectacles. So these are all going to reduce the input to the visual system and thereby increase the risk for falls. Now, another very interesting study that's just come out uh, is uh, that it may be actually be change in vision rather than the level of vision itself that might be more significant. So this one study looked at worsening vision and found that people whose vision had become worse within one year, so they had become visually impaired within one year prior to the date of the study, uh, they had more risk for falls and fractures than people who were already visually impaired. So it seems that we adapt to our level of vision, and it certainly seems to be true that uh, people who have more severe visual impairment or visual losses don't have as much increase in risk factor as you might expect from their very poor vision. So worsening vision is associated with increase, but perhaps even improved vision might be as well. And uh, we're going to come to talk about a study, um, a very frequently quoted study um, that uh, may indicate that, and I'll come back to that. What about uh, ha the type of spectacles that we wear? Yes, there are some studies that have looked at that. So it's been shown that multifocal wearers, and by that we mean people who are wearing either bifocals or trifocals, or the no-line type of bifocals, which we call progressive lenses, so they were all, all those types of lens wearers were found to have worse contrast sensitivity and worse stereopsis when they looked through the near portion, and they were two times more likely to fall. So what's going on here is that the near portion, this is a bifocal, an illustration of a bifocal. The near portion, of course, is for reading, and it's focused usually about 40 centimeters away. So if you look through that section of the lens when you're looking at the ground ahead of you, it's all going to be blurred and out of focus. So we advise patients to tip their chin down and look over the, through the distance portion when they're looking to where they're going to put their feet or going up and down steps. But it's been shown that often patients don't do this. People tend to still look through the bifocal segment. So then everything is going to be blurred, and uh, that does increase their risk for fall. And uh, you know, other studies have looked at how a person, how accurately a person places their steps. For example, going up and down stairs where they put their feet, and that um, people are more likely to make missteps when they are wearing bifocals or multifocals. And similarly, some studies have looked at uh, doing uh, people doing um, going around a mobility course and the er errors that they make, and people who wear multifocal lenses are more likely to make errors 
than people who wear single vision lenses, so that's with no bifocal in it. So I said I'd mention a little bit about my studies. So I've been looking at visual attention and mobility. So the first study was where we looked at, we asked the question whether visual attention fields would be a better predictor of mobility in people with visual impairment than clinical measures of vision. So again, I've talked already about what we mean by the visual attention fields. So in this study, we had 35 people with low vision, and we measured mobility as they walked around a mobility course. Now, this study was done in Australia, so it was very nice. We had good weather, so we could have an outside part of the course and an indoors part of the course, and it wasn't affected by weather too much. And uh, to make it a little bit more challenging, we seeded it with obstacles like some overhanging branches and some um, long rulers that were meant to sort of give the impression of a step. Um, and there were also obstacles that the person, this is a step ladder here, so the person had to say as soon as they recognized that there was a step ladder there or an obstacle in their way. And we looked at various measures of mobility. You can measure it in terms of how long the person takes to go around this course or how many errors they make as they're going around, for example, bumping into things or hesitating because they're not sure whether there's something there or not. Of course, for safety, we didn't actually let them uh, bump into anything that would be dangerous. Uh, so, yeah, so what did we find? Uh, we also measured the standard measures of visual function or clinical measures of visual function as listed here, and I've already described most of these. So, what we, what we found was that the mobility errors and the walking speed was much more strongly predicted by the visual attention fields than the other um, measures of clinical vision. So, there's a strong, obviously strong aspect of visual attention required when you're walking about. But uh, identifying and detecting those objects, like the stepladder, were more predicted by the clinical measures, such as visual acuity and contrast sensitivity, which again isn't surprising. But what this shows us is that mobility, even from a visual point of view, is a complex function. And uh, of course, when you consider the biomechanical aspect of it, it's, it's even more complex again. Uh, so leading from that study, we then went on to measure um, visual attention again and to compare it with some clinical measures of balance and walking. And in this study, we also included some measures of binocular vision as well uh, because we had already found out that there's a very high prevalence of binocular vision and eye movement disorders in older people, ranging up to about 38% of people having these disorders in the oldest age group, which was 80 plus years. So we were asking the question whether there is a link between those things. In this case, we were using people who had relatively normal vision, so 64 community and retirement home dwelling people. And uh, we measured again the usual clinical measures of vision and the visual attention and the presence or absence of a binocular vision disorder. We also measured intermediate visual acuity. So when you're walking about, probably what's most important is not so much your visual acuity at far distance, or obviously for reading. What's important, perhaps, is your visual acuity for where you're going to put your next few steps. So we measured this both through the um, equivalent of the top of the person's bifocal lens and through their bottom or reading part of their bifocal lens. And we used some clinical measures of balance and mobility, which you may be familiar with. So the sit-to-stand test, where you're timing the person as they sit or st and stand for five times. Um, a five-meter walking test, how quickly they walk along a clear corridor, and a one-legged stance test. You're probably familiar with those. And so the results, well, we found a very high percentage of people, 69% had abnormal binocular vision and eye movements. That's even higher than our previous study. And a very high percentage of people who had reduced stereopsis as well. And what we found with regards to the test was the sit to stand test was predicted by uh, a number of different factors, but as you can see listed here, but specifically in that intermediate visual acuity, so the visual acuity for the next few steps, 
and binocular vision. The five-meter walking test was predicted by, uh, inter again, by intermediate visual acuity. And the one-legged stance test was, again, pred predicted by binocular vision and the performance on the visual attention fields test. So there, you know, there are these other aspects of vision which are predicting some of these tests. So of course, the next obvious question is, can training visual attention, which we know already is trainable, help with a person's mobility or their balance? And um, in fact, we have a couple of studies that are going on right now that are looking at this question, uh, training visual attention by itself or in conjunction with exercise. And then uh, last time I mentioned the study about vision and falls in hospitals where we had actually gone into a hospital wards and uh, we were measuring uh, aspects of people's vision and th this time it was just a simple clinical measures of vision amongst these hospital patients. So these were not particularly patients who had been admitted for falls. They were admitted for a whole variety of different reasons. Uh, and I've already mentioned how a very high percentage of them were found to have reduced visual acuity or reduced stereopsis. So in this study, we had 115 patients. Interestingly, 24 were admitted for a fall. That was the reason for admission to hospital. Ten of them fell while they were in the hospital. And in fact, two of them were both admitted for a fall and then went and fell again while they were in the hospital. And the fallers, that, um, these 10 fallers that fell during the hospital stay were matched with a non-faller in terms of their sex, their age, and a multi-morbidity score that we calculated and a medication score. And these scores were sort of biased towards the risk factors for falls. And here there is some results. So we found that there was a significantly higher number of falls, despite the fact that there were only 10 fallers in this particular preliminary study. Um, there were a significantly higher number of them with visual impairment. And uh, that was based on visual acuity again, or aspects of, or different ways of measuring their stereo acuity or stereopsis. So again, we are finding that there is preliminary evidence that even in a hospital set, setting where there are very many factors, some of them based on the individual person, some of them based on the way that hospital procedures are done and units are run. So even in that situation, there's that vision has some part to play. And OK, so that's our studies uh, and a review of what aspects of vision are linked with falls. So since there is this strong link that has been found by most studies, the obvious question is, if we can improve vision, then will that decrease the risk of falls? So what is the evidence for that? So first, I'll talk a little bit about cataract surgery. So there's quite a few studies that have looked at this. Some of them are older studies that found that cataract surgery on the first eye, so most people who have cataracts have it in both eyes, and you do the surgery it different times. So these studies found that um, first eye cataract surgery did reduce falls and fractures. But a couple of studies found that the second cataract surgery on the second eye did not have any effect in that way, which is a little surprising since we've already found that uh, a difference between the two eyes is a significant factor. And then a few more recent studies. There's a little bit of discrepancy in some of these studies. So a study in Australia found that the falls increased between the first and second, increased, I should say, between the first and second eye cataract surgery and after the second so, uh, eye surgery. But this was compared to the number of falls in the year before the first eye cataract surgery. So, you know, this is a longitudinal study. It's not a randomized clinical trial, which would be the best level of ed evidence. And of course, over this time period, people, of course, are getting older and more prone to falls anyway. In Vietnam, they found the opposite result. And this was actually uh, the same similar group of people did the, both of these studies. And here they found that the first eye cataract surgery decreased the risk of falls quite significantly, and as did the second eye cataract surgery. And then a study in the US looked at cataract surgery and found that it decreased the risk of hip fractures. So 
Overall, there does seem to be a fair amount of evidence that cataract surgery, particularly for the first eye, is effective at reducing falls. Another so another way that we can improve people's vision, of course, is by having an eye exam and possibly changing people's spectacles if they need it. So there haven't been very many studies like this, but the study by Cummings that I mentioned earlier did a randomized clinical trial, and of course that is one of our highest levels of evidence for um, any kind of intervention being effective. Um, so they did an RCT of comprehensive eye examination, and what this included was going to the optometrist and having a spectacle correction change if necessary, referral to an ophthalmologist if necessary, or to an occupational therapist if the person had low, vi low vision um, for help around the home. So that's what the intervention was, and the some people were randomized to that, and the other people, the controls, were randomized just to continue uh, with their usual care. What they found was that falls and fractures were more frequent in the intervention than in the control group in the first six months, although there was no difference in the second six months. So that probably was not what they were hoping or expecting to find. But when we drill down a little bit more into their data, what we see is that uh, as it happens, only 44% of the intervention group actually received any therapy. So just having an eye exam, if you're not having any therapy or any change of your prescription, isn't expected to help. So only 44% had any therapy and only 30% received new glasses. On the other hand, if you look at the control group, what you find is that 72% of the control group visited their optometrist or ophthalmologist anyway. So there's not really much difference in what's going on in this control and this intervention group. And this kind of illustrates the difficulty of conducting this type of uh, study. Because when you're doing this type of study, you have to explain to people why you're doing the study. And of course, you have to explain your hypothesis. We expect that um, uh, having your spectacles or having an eye exam may decrease your risk for falls. So you've implanted that idea into the control group, and it's probably likely that they might think, oh, yes, I'm due for an eye exam. Perhaps I better go, and they take themselves off and have an eye exam themselves. So this is what we call crossover in these types of studies. So as I said, I think that they found that they were a little bit surprised by their own results. And they explained the results by changes in behavior that people, once they had improved vision, uh, you know, perhaps took slightly more risk, risks in their behavior, were a little bit more confident, perhaps, and therefore more likely to fall. Or maybe that there's a time, the adaptation time to spectacles may have been a factor, or that the control group were slightly less inclined to report falls than the intervention group. In their discussion, they basically said it is not possible to reach any firm conclusions from the present study. A serious flaw in the design was the failure to provide any form of intervention to the control group. Um, so basically, as I said already, there was crossover um, between the two groups. Now, interestingly, in the abstract, they don't say that. They simply say that falls occurred more frequently in the group randomized to receive the vision intervention than in the control group. So if somebody comes along and only reads the abstract, then you're really going to get a distorted view of the significance of this study. So a little bit, uh, I say to my students, this, in, this indicates why it's important to read the whole study and not just the abstract. So they did, though, do a sub-analysis that uh, perhaps gives us a little bit of useful information. Um, and what they found was they looked at the amount of the spectacle change in terms of how much power the spectacles were changed by. And they found that there was a slight trend that greater changes in the spectacle prescription resulted in more falls risk. So those with large changes in terms of three quarters of a diopter or more had more falls but those who had just minor changes did not have an increased false risk. So it might be something to do with the amount of change and the adaptation to new spectacles. And the only other study, which is a randomized clinical trial of spectacle provision by itself, was done by a group called Haran et al. They were 
uh, also in Australia. So what they did was that they um, their their intervention was providing people with single vision spectacles, i.e. taking them out of their bifocal spectacles for outdoor wear. Because people are not going to want to get rid of the convenience of bifocals for all time and for indoor wear, but maybe for outdoor wear it might help. And what they found was that there was no overall effect. So um, in this particular study, they also ended up prescribing tints in these uh, single vision glasses for outdoors. Um, perhaps as a way of encouraging people to be involved in the study, because as I said, it was in Australia. So they did do a sub-analysis as well, and they found that for those people who were more active, who regularly exercised outside, there was a 40% reduction in falls by wearing the single vision glasses out of doors. Um, but in fact, an increase in falls for those who did little outside activity and who were basically staying indoors most of the time. So this sort of indicates that pe for people who are more active, it may be helpful if we give them an additional pair of single vision glasses. So why do we get these mixed results? I've already mentioned about crossover in the different what we call arms of the study, the intervention group versus the control group. Um, also, I think another problem is that in the first study and some of the other studies that have looked at uh, vision intervention in combination with other interventions like exercise. The vision intervention has often been just a uh, referral to an optometrist or going to see an eye doctor. That doesn't necessarily mean that they're getting any change or therapy. If they do change their glasses, often there may be confounding effects like changes in the lens design, so different types of lenses, single vision or bifocal or progressive lenses, and that may be a confounding factor. And uh, another thing that happens when you have your spectacles changed, of course, you hope that your vision is going to be clearer. But at the same time, there's almost always going to be a change in magnification. So this is sort of like a side effect of the spectacle lenses. So the image with the new glasses might be larger or smaller, depending on which way the prescription change is going. And that would result in objects being perceived as closer or further away until you adapt to the new glasses. And this can result in misstepping, so either stepping too high or too low when you go up a step, for example. So that's one aspect. Also, uh, there is adaptation will be required to the vestibular ocular reflex gain. So what this is is when we turn our head, there's um, an automatic reflex which turns our eyes in the opposite direction in order to keep the retinal image stable. So when you have a change in your spectacles, the eyes will have to move either faster or slower to maintain this stable perception. And this is thought to result in what patients will describe as a swimming effect with the new glasses. And lastly, if there's a change in astigmatism in either the direction of the astigmatism or the power of it, this can result in things looking sloping to begin with until the person directs, um, sorry, adapts to their new glasses. So that's all the evidence. So based on this current evidence, uh, I'm just going to talk about one fall prevention guideline that has been brought out by the American Geriatric Society in combination with the British Geriatric Society. This is their clinical practice guideline. And based on the level of the evidence, how good the evidence is, they are recommending multi-component programs for fall prevention, including exercise, and environmental adaptations and modifications, medication reduction or withdrawal, management of visual defects, specifically and especially cataracts, because there is the highest level of evidence is, that, or sorry, I should say the level of evidence is better for cataract surgery than other kinds of vision improvement. And then management or treatment of postural hypertension and other cardiac and medical problems and education. So vision assessment and uh, vision intervention is part of a falls assessment and management. 
So what, as an optometrist, um, is the role here? So this is how I teach my students currently. So optometrist as a profession is becoming more aware of the issues of falls in older people. And certainly, as I said, my students will be taught this. Um, and it is being taught in continuing education programs amongst optometrists. So what is our role? So firstly, we say that we must be aware of those who are at risk. And when we see our patients, of course, we will know what their health conditions are and what their medications are. And uh, we usually get a pretty good idea during the eye exam of how their cognitive function is. So we will be aware of those factors which are risk factors for falls. We can also, of course, ask our patients about falls, whether they've fallen in certain last time, uh, recent time periods, how many times, and whether the person feels worried about falling. And of course, we uh, can ask them about difficulties with mobility, with glare, do they have problems with glare, or adapting to light changes, for example. So these are uh, uh, questions that we can easily ask. And of course, now, since vision is meant to be part of a falls prevention program or a falls assessment, more optometrists will hopefully be seeing patients who are being referred to them specifically for that reason. Then, of course, we can, we can observe the patient, although we're not experts in this area, but it can be pretty obvious sometimes when a person is unstable and frail. Uh, we can also think about the state and the fitting of the spectacles. If the spectacles are, are scratched and fitting poorly, then that's probably certainly not going to help the situation. In our visual assessment, we would always be measure, measuring visual acuity and some of these other aspects of vision as well. There are some prescribing considerations that we can take into account. Uh, I've already mentioned um, about large power changes are probably uh, a risk factor with the current level of evidence that we have. So we would try to avoid large power changes. Uh, how do you avoid that? Well, by having frequent or regular examinations, probably at least every year. If you leave the time period too long between eye exams, then you're more likely to have a bigger power change. And then what do you do? So the only way around that is if you don't want, you think it's a risk to give a larger power change to a patient is to give a partial change. So only partially sort of update their spectacles. But that means that you would have to change it again in six months' time or so. So not, that's not the ideal, obviously. We can also be more careful in our counseling regarding adaptation, um, particularly for people who appear to be frail and at risk for falls. So going through that more carefully with patients, talking about the magnification effects, and talking about adapting to the new glasses in the house before going out, probably. There are some dispensing considerations that we can consider. So for example, not putting people or suggesting people have new, a different type of bifocal than what they currently have. Generally speaking, it's better and safer if people just stay to the same lens design that they are used to. You know, the old adage, don't um, fix it if it's not broken. Or for people who are a little bit more active, it might be good for them to have a single vision pair of glasses for outside use as well. Um, but not so much for those people who were um, more chair bound. For those people who don't have very much of a distance prescription, they might be safer taking their bifocals off when they're out of doors. Um, or in some cases, it may be safer for people to be taken out of bifocals altogether and have two separate pairs of glasses. We should be thinking about the frame. We don't want a big, thick frame that's going going to impede their peripheral vision. Um, we, if, uh, I've mentioned already, many older patients have frames and lenses that are in not in good condition. So that's not going to be helpful. Often the frames can be crooked and very badly fitting. So improving, updating those should be beneficial. We might need to re-educate people about their use of bifocals and progressive lenses. So mentioning again about the importance to look over their bifocal or over their progressive progressive lens, when they, particularly when they're going up or down stairs, although this is difficult for older people to do, to tuck in their chin um, enough so that they're looking over the bifocal portion. 
Also, many older people will walk about with their reading glasses on, so educating people about not doing that. And then talking about tints for light adaptation and glare reduction, in if that is a problem with people. And I think I mentioned already about these types of tints. The ones that are sort of yellowish or brownish can help to reduce, to increase contrast and reduce glare. And then, of course, we would be aware of managing disease um, in terms of falls, very specifically referring for cataract surgery in a prompt way. Um, but also, of course, we're going to be aware anyway of treating glaucoma and diabetes optimally. And then we would be involved in referring to other uh, healthcare or community care programs and communicating with the doctor or gerod gerontologist. So those are the things that we can do individually for a patient in terms of their own vision, but there are also environmental adaptations that can be considered. We know that home is the most common place for falls. About 26% of these happen on stairs, and 44% slip, trip, and stumble on any surface. So uh, we all can be involved in discussing environmental modifications for our older patients. Um, but it's good to ensure that a family member is there. Uh, as I'm sure many of you are aware, older people can be quite resistant to changes in their home environment. And then talking about education and awareness as well. So what are the things that uh, we can talk about uh, or that can be done in terms of a visual aspect of modification of the home environment? So the first thing is good lighting. So particularly, lighting can be bad in hallways and stairs, and particularly at night. So often people, when they get up to go to the washroom at night, and here we have an example of a fairly dimly lit stairway. So people don't want to put the light on because it wakes them up too much. But they are then exposing themselves to a risk because, again, there's going to be less visual input. They can't see where the stairs are. They're going to be more likely to trip and fall. So good lighting on stairways and turning the lights on. And on the right-hand side, we have an example where we've got fairly good lighting, general lighting, and task lighting in this kitchen. Uh, the second main thing is contrast, increasing the contrast. So and here's some examples on the bottom here. So here we have that same set of stairs. You can see that uh, when you're walking upstairs, you can actually see the edges of the stairs not too badly. But when you're looking down the same set of stairs, you can see how there's very little contrast on the edges of the stairs to see where the edges of the step is. So putting a line, uh, painting a line along the edges of the stairs can certainly help with that. And the line should be in contrast. So if you've got stairs that are a dark color, then a light edge to the stairs would be good. But if you have stairs that are basically a light color, then you would put a darker strip on the edge. So whatever is going to give the best contrast. And uh, I could put this uh, website here. This is from the American Foundation for the Blind. And it gives a lot of resources and ideas that uh, talk gives me other examples about contrast and how to improve things around the home for people with visual impairment. But a lot of this would be relevant for people who are older and um, just have the normal sort of changes with age. Another thing to think about is, uh, if possible, to try to eliminate and not have too many changes in floor color or floor contrast. So people with dementia or very or quite low vision or visual impairment may think that there's a step there. So here where there's this change at this doorway, a person might not be sure whether there's a step there as well, and so it may, they may hesitate. Or having a darker mat like this may actually cause some people with dementia to hesitate. They may see it as a drop-off um, instead of a step or a mat. What about color? So color can be used. And I did find some sort of just expanding this a little bit for um, some ideas for people with dementia or delirium. But the choice of color of paint for the walls and so on can be, uh, can be, used, can be is something that we can think about. So in terms of the older eye and the 
the parts of the spectrum that the older eye is going to absorb or not absorb, then it's probably good to consider a light yellow for wolves. So this is thought to have the eye to be this is thought to be a relaxing color and cheerful, and also it can be seen quite well by the aging eye. Or possibly you might consider a light peach color or a light green color. And then for contrast, for things that you want uh, those people to be able to see very easily, then a bright or darker blue or red uh, to use those as a highlight. So here's some general principles about color contrast. Uh, so if we're using color to emphasize things, then we want there to be a contrast not only in color, but also in the light differences as well. So putting two dark colors together like this is not going to be easy for somebody who has either poor color vision or just poor visual acuity, poor contrast sensitivity. So we always want to put a dark color together with a light color. So that's one rule. We also want to use colors that, there are certain colors that are naturally dark and some colors that are naturally light. So those on the top of this color wheel are those which are naturally dark and those on the bottom are naturally light. So picking one dark one and one light one should work. And then the last rule is avoiding hues from adjacent parts of the color wheel. So that, this is this example again here where I've got a blue against a mauve. They're from adjacent parts of the color spectrum. So anybody with uh, loss who has reduced color discrimination is going to find that difficult. So these are some rules that we can use, some guidelines if you like, that um, if we go using color with our older patients. And here's just a little bit more of a refinement of that idea. So avoid using desaturated colors together. So the desaturated colors are the pastel colors, or what I say is the dingy, muddy, muddy colors when I'm talking about this with some um, patients. So you don't want to have two pastel colors together or two muddy colors together. You can use a desaturated color with a saturated color. These are the bright colors, if you like, or, or a pastel one with a muddy one, but not two muddy ones or two um, pastel ones together. And then uh, another aspect that we can help people with in terms of vision in their environment is to reduce busy patterns and clutter. So you can see on the right hand side here this picture how there's lots of trip hazards in this room here, lots of things on the floor, obvious trip hazards. But you know this, this uh, picture on the top here doesn't have so many obvious trip hazards, but it has a lot of busy patterns going on, which is going to make it harder for older patients. And similarly, this pattern, this uh, carpeted pattern here is not going to be very easy for a person who with an older person to deal with. It would be better if the carpet here was plain, a plain color. Okay. And lastly, I put education here as an important aspect. So just talking with people about some of these risks can make a lot of difference. So I remember my um, one of my research students who has been working on one of the studies that I mentioned. And he was looking at people uh, and asking them about their number of folds for the six months prior to his study and then the six months after his study. And he was finding fewer falls in the six months after his study. And I was saying, what, what have you been doing with your patients? I would expect them, if anything, to have more falls as they're getting older. And uh, he said that uh, he's just been chatting with them and talking about some very simple things, such as you know, just having one point of contact. If you just touch with your finger on a wall or on an object, a piece of furniture, it can stabilize you doesn't have to be a firm hand grip, just one finger it can stabilize a person in certain situations. So talking about some of these false risks is obviously important. So this is uh, some of the people who have invo been involved in some of the studies that I mentioned. So my thanks to those. And yes, so lastly, any questions? I think there's a little time for questions now. Thank you so much, Sue.
So if there are any questions, um, I invite you to now type them into the chat box. You're also welcome to dial star 7 on your telephone keypad to unmute your line if you find it easier just to ask over the phone. So how about I give um, an opportunity to unmute your line first. So if anyone's interested in asking our presenter a question, please dial star 7 now and you can just start speaking. Okay, in that case, I will read some questions from, um, from the chat box. So the first question is, um, are you fam aware of the current provincial wait time for cataract surgery? Oh, <laughs> um, I don't actually have that exact figure to mind. Um, I'm, I, I think I'd rather not answer that because I'm really not sure exactly how much it is in terms of months. Okay, no problem. Um, another question is, if the stairs are carpeted, what should you use to provide color contrast? Hmm, that's a good question. Uh, so if you can't remove the carpet, then um, you could put some tape, like sort of masking tape or... Um, the sort of plasticized kind of tape along the edge of the uh, carpet of the stair, but you'd have to be very careful that you keep an eye on it, that it doesn't start fraying and coming up, and that would cause an additional, you know, an extra trip hazard then. Um, unless, that, that would be the only two things I can really think of at the moment. Okay. Um, are there any studies showing if there's a decrease in falls with daily physical activity or exercise? Oh, yes, there's a lot of studies. Um, what was the first thing you said? Exercise um, and? Physical activity and exercise. Oh, physical, ex yes. Um, there's a whole lot of literature on this, and there is good evidence that uh, certain types of ex um, exercise is useful in that way. Um, particularly, I think the evidence is stronger for uh, exercise, which includes balance and strength control and gait and shifting of weight. But I think that you know there's been quite a few studies that have looked at um, Tai Chi, for example, or use of the We Fit types of exercise, um, general walking. Uh, I think any of these exercises are useful as long as they're done in a safe way. Um, I think uh, yoga actually is another one that has been uh, looked at. I think in studies. So I didn't include that in the talk here because you know I was obviously concentrating on vision. But if you noticed in the slide where I was talking about the guidelines for prevention, exercise is definitely included there. Excellent. And a great resource for more information on falls and um, physical activity is the Canadian Centre on Activity and Aging, which is based out of London, Ontario. Mm -hmm. If you go to their website, um, they have lots and lots of information there about that link. The Seniors Health Knowledge Network and the Fall Prevention Community of Practice have also done some previous webinars on um, exercise and falls. We just finished up two webinars in the past few months with Claire Fitzgerald from the CCAA um, that I mentioned, the one in London. And um, so there's quite extensive information in there and some examples of different exercises that you can do um, with older adults to decrease their falls risk as well. So those are both recorded and archived on our YouTube channel. So you can just search Seniors Health Knowledge Network in YouTube and you'll come up with our channel there or there's a link from the Seniors Health Knowledge Network website. Yep, thank you. What do you suggest for lighting a room at night if a senior has to get up to use the bathroom frequently? Well, I think that a little nightlight is probably useful, but uh, they should be really encouraged um, to reduce their falls. They should be encouraged to put the full light on, like the normal overhead lighting when they get up, because any dimmer lighting is going to reduce their visual input and from a vision point of view, of course, make them more prone to having a fall. But I recognize that uh, um, older people often don't like to do that because they often don't sleep very well. And so putting on the full lighting is uh, going to wake them up and you know disturb their sleep more. So I recognize that it can be, that there's a balance. And I, mean, I suppose you have to sort of balance those two aspects. But from a, from a risk for falls point of view, I think it's safer to put on the full overhead lighting. 
Great. So, I mean, ideally you would have a switch close to your bed so that you can do that. All right. So that's all the questions that we have in the chat box right now. Um, if anyone else does have a question, at this point you should probably unmute your line by dialing star 7, um, just because otherwise we don't know if you're typing and we might finish up and wrap up if there's no more questions. So star seven if there are any final questions uh, for our presenter, Susan Leet, on Vision and Falls. Okay, one final question in the chat box. Um, would you advise older adults to use a flashlight at night? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a possibility. Um, a flashlight, of course, will give you central vision certainly better than walking around in, you know, without a, an extra light. But it's only going to give you central vision, so you're not going to get that peripheral vision. So it's not going to be give you as much control of your balance or your walking as putting on the full light, the full overhead lighting. So it's, so I would say it's better than nothing, but probably not ideal. And I suppose I can understand that another factor that I haven't mentioned is if you're sharing a room with somebody else, uh, then you don't want to put on the full lighting. So uh, maybe that would be a compromise in that situation. All these things, you have to balance various factors, I suppose, to get the best, situ uh, the best result. Would um, putting the full light on cause any difficulty adjusting to the sort of complete change in light to dark? That's a good question, and because we did talk about older people ha taking a little bit longer to dark and light adapt than younger people. But our light adaptation is much, much faster than our dark adaptation. So adjusting to the dark can take up to about 40 minutes to get to your full sensitivity. But we adjust to light very quickly within you know, 30, well, a few seconds really, or 30 seconds or so. So I don't think that's so much of a factor or so much of a consideration. Okay. Um, when you're doing the contrasting on stairs, is there any concern about it being a trip hazard? Well, as I said, uh, it depends how you do it. So if you're painting the edge of stairs, then I don't think that would be, I can't see how that would be a trip hazard. It would be a, only a benefit. But if you have some situation where you can't paint the edge of the stairs for some reason or another, then and you're using tape instead, then that could become a trip hazard if it starts spraying or peeling off. And so you really need to keep a close uh, eye on that and replace it as soon as necessary if it does start peeling off. Because if, starts, if the edge comes up, up, then it would become a trip hazard. Well, I think that's all of our questions for today, and we're just about out of time as well. So I'd like to thank our presenter today for providing us that valuable information, and thank all of our participants for engaging in a great discussion and sharing your questions with us so that we can all learn together. I would like to ask that you please do not close this webinar window until you have been redirected to the Level 3 lobby screen. Once you see that screen, it's safe to close the window and a very brief evaluation survey will appear in your web browser. We'd appreciate it if you could just take a few minutes to fill out that survey for us so we can continue to improve and offer quality webinars in the future. As mentioned previously, a recording of this webinar is going to be posted on our YouTube channel as well as circulated to all the participants in the coming week or so. Feel free to pass it along and share it with any colleagues you think might be interested. For more information on the network and to join one or more of our communities of practice, including the Falls Prevention Community of Practice, please visit SeniorsHealthKnowledgeNetwork.com. Thanks, everyone, and have a great day.